I didn't have an off the shelf plugin system that I could incorporate in my app. So I had to make those decisions and kind of reinvent the wheel over and over and over and over again. And when I first learned of WebAssembly five years ago now, the first thing that it struck me as was a contender for a likely last plugin system or execution format that we ever need. Hey, before we get started, I'd like to remind you the full episode is only available to our subscribers. The current platforms you can subscribe on are Patreon, Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. The full version of this week's episode, you get to hear all of our tool tips. And this week, it was interesting. And with that, let's get on to the episode. Hello, welcome to the DevTools FM podcast. This is a podcast about developer tools and the people who make them. I'm Andrew, and this is my co-host, Justin. Hey, everyone. Our guests today are Steve Manuel and Ben Eckel from Delibso. <laughs> so I originally heard of y'all's work through this project called Xdism, which is like a, mm-hmm. a WASM extension framework. That's really cool. I'm so excited to talk about that. I've been sort of following it for a while and really wanting to dig into it deeper. But before we do that, take some time to tell us about yourselves and about your company. What do you you do? Sure. Uh, my name's Steve. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Delibso. Originally founded in August of 2022 with the formation of the project Xism. That was kind of the first thing we launched. Before Xism, I was working as a compiler engineer at a quantum computing company, kind of bridging the worlds of quantum and classical computing. And then prior to that was at Cloudflare, where I worked on the workers platform and built the workers RS project to bring Rust support to the edge and allow for an alternative language to be used as kind of a first-class citizen for the workers platform, which is previously just JavaScript. Yeah, my name's Ben. Before Dialypso, I was working at Datadog. One of the things I was working on was trying to figure out how some of Datadog's tools would work in some of these newer deployment environments like the Edge, like Cloudflare Workers and Fastly Computed Edge, stuff like that. I was like porting some of the tools to work in the Edge and I really kind of reignited a lot of my interest in the technology. And that's when I got back in touch with Steve and we co-founded this company along with our other co-founder, Zach. That's my short history of Dialypso. A brief background of the company, primary mission is to help you take WebAssembly to production and then keep it there. And so for all the developers who are working right now and kind of learning about WASM and experimenting with this new technology, there's a lot of gaps between, you know, writing your first line of code, compiling to WASM, and then all the steps in between going to production. And so we build validation tools, testing, debugging, visibility, and observability tools to basically kind of help fill those gaps of taking WASM to production and then wanting to make sure that you have a good experience with it once it's in prod too. Cool. Before we dive into the tools that you guys have built, why WASM? Why do you find it a new, exciting technology, one so exciting that you want to build a company around it? Yeah, there's sort of a personal and there's more of like a a kind of professional, um, something that's more of a reason in the context of, you know, all your audience. And then those two things kind of intertwine. But personally, for me, I find WASM exciting because I really like to work with what I would call programming language infrastructure. I like reading about computing and things from the past. And WASM kind of combines a lot of those different things for me, just in terms of the type of work that I'm doing in this space. And it's also really challenging. I mean, personally, I find those things to be really great and exciting. And then there's also the aspect of why it's important for our industry. And to me, I think the most important thing about it really is its sandboxing capabilities and all of its denied by default capabilities. And I find that to be a little bit interesting and something that people overlook because typically as developers, we look at security innovation and we look at security as a hindrance to our job. A lot of times it's something that generally slows us down. But actually, if you look back at a lot of the advancements over the past 30 years or so, a lot of it is driven by advancements in isolation technology, right? Like going from hardware to virtual machines, going from virtual machines to containers, and now going from containers to WASM. And this idea of basically moving the isolation boundary up closer to the application to where your applications are smaller and faster, and you can pack more of them on a system. I don't really know everywhere that WebAssembly is going to go, but I know that in 10 years, like this 2023 will be kind of a watermark moment for the evolution of a lot of these technologies. I think WASM will be the reason why. Just to add my two cents into there, like I've written a lot of code and a lot of different programming languages, and I've rewritten a lot of code from one language into another language. And I always just kind of find it a shame when I've got to basically like port something into another language just because it's got to run in the stack that the company has chosen for a certain project. WebAssembly provides maybe not the first, but maybe like the first real actualization of an opportunity to kind of reuse a bunch of you know code that's sitting around in older libraries 
And because WebAssembly targets a single ISA, an instruction set that's common across every runtime where WASM runs, you can do a lot of really interesting things with that as kind of your you know, foundational layer. And instead of having to instrument all your source code with libraries and then expect the developer to do that right and include all of the places where you know a trace needs to be run and a span needs to follow and then more spans, a lot of these things can be done automatically. And beyond instrumentation, debugging and analysis, uh, there's a lot you could do with a common instruction set. And some of this was illuminated for me working in compilers with the LLVM tool chain, where once you get your language down to LLVMIR, that's really where the magic happens. And WebAssembly brings this kind of to a more approachable layer where more languages can run in more environments, that we can bring more tooling to this ecosystem. And I always kind of say that like, we want to make WebAssembly you know, everybody's favorite binary format. But like nobody really thinks about binary formats or cares about binary formats. And so I think there's an opportunity to like make people actually care about this binary format. This is such a really interesting topic. I mean, as long as programming has been a thing, we've always wanted to share code and reuse code, right? And that's only become more and more important as our software systems have gotten more and more complex. And I think we've taken a lot of cracks at it, you know, whether it's like, you know, DLLs or like shared objects, or maybe even like getting into things like the JVM, like building common runtimes where you can have like different language compilers. I know like Erlang is sort of like developing a similar sort of ecosystem. You have like all these different approaches to doing this thing where it's like, you know, we're potentially going to have multiple languages and we want to kind of run it on a shared ecosystem. But a lot of these are very specific to an ecosystem. And I think your point about LLVM is, is really an interesting one because it has become this sort of like common baseline in a way for like a lot of compiled languages that have let people upstream think about one set of problems and people downstream set, think about a separate set of problems, which is like, I think, tremendously valuable to get sort of just like a greater lift in the industry of just like all that effort. Because if you're thinking about like, oh, well, I'm going to optimize the JavaScript runtime or I'm going to optimize uh, Erlang runtime or JVM or something like that, that's only benefiting really those sort of like siloed ecosystems. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, and while they are like a clean target for like higher level languages to come down and compile to, sure. a lot of the ISA for CLR or JVM was designed with the higher level language in mind already. And just tying those two together at that early stage makes it much more difficult for other languages that don't have maybe the same semantics or the same paradigms for security or programming models, you know, kind of fit into that ISA as like this lower level, you know, compilation state. And WebAssembly was designed from the outset to not have a language really attached to it as its higher level format. And I think that's really helped it gain traction as a target for a bunch of different languages to compile to, which is really exciting. And we think is a you know, pretty critical component for WebAssembly as it matures is for more and more languages to make it down to WASM. And we're seeing a lot of progress, which is great. Yeah. And also you were talking about Erlang, for instance, and the JVM. A lot of people target these as generic platforms for their code, but both of those things come with a lot of stuff that you probably don't need. Um, like the JVM, you can't really allocate memory without having it be garbage collected. Also the JVM, any program that you run in JVM can do whatever it wants. It can open sockets, it can open files. And WebAssembly is nice because it comes with nothing, right? And if you don't need anything, then your WebAssembly program will be very fast and very secure. And if you want those things, then you have to explicitly opt into them. Yeah, it's interesting. For a lot of the listeners to this podcast, maybe the first sort of like sandboxing experience that they've had was just like running JavaScript and a browser. <laughs> like I have a tab that's running JavaScript. Uh, there is a very interesting correlation here to like Node, uh, which took, you know, this language that sort of had ran historically in a sandbox environment and now has like access to everything, kind of like the JVM, and then contrast that with like Dino, how it has a like more fine-grained permission model. And I know that's coming to Node too, but like Dino designed from the outset to have a more fine-grained permission model. So it's kind of in a similar vein of like, you can sort of think of this in that way. It's like building something in a sandbox where you can really control or just give access to what it needs needs and nothing else. It's really awesome. Totally. So uh, let's talk a little bit about Xtism. Uh, this is really exciting for me. I, I tell the story a lot that one of the things that really got me into programming was modding in games. And like a lot of modding engines are very like crude <laughs> plugin systems. Uh, so maybe you could uh, just talk a little bit about what Xtism is and sort of what the motivation behind building it was. 
Sure. Uh, I mean, this goes back a long ways. I've written too many plugin systems to like, you know, care to talk about. And it frustrated me every single time trying to basically make the same decisions using a different stack or different language or a different model of executing the plugin and what format is it going to be in? How am I going to give it some data to kind of be initialized with? And once it's initialized, how does it get access to other data? And can that plugin call other plugins? Like just all these things, like ultimately somebody else could have made these decisions and put them into a box for me. And I could have taken that box and put them into my program and then moved on with my life and been done with my plugin system. But it just didn't exist. I didn't have an off the shelf plugin system that I could incorporate in my app. So I had to make those decisions and kind of reinvent the wheel over and over and over and over again. And when I first learned of WebAssembly five years ago now, the first thing that it struck me as was a contender for a likely last plugin system or execution format that we ever need. And someone just needs to like make a runtime that can take WebAssembly, give it some data, allow for arbitrary function to be called, and then get some data back. And that's oversimplifying a little bit, but effectively like that's the plugin system. And so for those who aren't aware what a plugin system really is or does, it takes your application and lets the programmer of that application kind of define a extension point or multiple extension points through the life cycle of that program and say, end user, give me some code and I'll run your code at this point in my program. And then the next step of the program will take the results of your plugin and do something new. So Maybe we don't cover all of the needs for you as an end user within our program's capabilities. We have a plugin system that lets you give us some code. We'll run that code. And now the program has extra capabilities that we didn't think of, we didn't ship, but you've imbued into the program itself. And it's a really powerful concept and can give engineering teams like a huge relief from these backlogs that ultimately like take up way more time than the teams ultimately expect them to. But it was really that idea of like, could we create this universal off the shelf plugin system that any program can use to embed and kind of immediately get this plugin system available to it. And so just one day kind of decided I'd had enough. I'd thought about it enough. I just needed to build this thing. And uh, it took a couple of days to kind of create a proof of concept and got it far enough along to bring on, you know, Zach and Ben, who have taken it way further beyond my imagination. And I'm very thankful that they were interested enough to come on and help. XTism now is a plugin system that can be embedded into 15 different programming languages, including the browser and server environments. You can run plugins in your code that are compiled to WebAssembly. We have official support for seven different programming languages that compile to WASM, but theoretically anything that can compile to WASM could be run as XTism plugin. And we've got an incredible open source community and Discord made up of programmers of all different levels of experience in different programming languages. And it really gives us a cool insight into the world of like, how are people starting to think about WebAssembly? How are they using it? What problems are they having? And it inspires a lot of the product development that we ultimately move into at the company. So the features that XTism built on in WASM are that portability and that security. Are there any other features of WASM that help enable XTism to do cool things? Yeah, it's funny. You really nailed it, right? It's like what's really important about XTism are those two key aspects, portability and security. And just to kind of give people some insight about why those things are important, security, again, instead of just looking at it generically as like not getting hacked or something that kind of restricts you in some way, it's actually an enabling feature, right? Because if you... Talk Talk to a lot of web developers, we've had a lot of trouble explaining to people what a plugin system is. Because what's happened is a long time ago, or maybe back in the 90s, early aughts, back before we moved to the web and we had this kind of client compute model, plugin systems were very common. A lot of your desktop apps have them. Your browser has it. We've done a lot of like reading about like music technology from the old days that has plugin systems. And it was always a common thing, right? And you just take a shared object of code that you could download online and you could plug it into your application and people could extend it, right? Game modding is another great example example, right? But what happened is when you moved back to the web, we couldn't really take shared objects with us, right? And there were all sorts of security problems with now doing plugin systems in a multi-tenant environment. So I think like really one of the interesting things about this security aspect is it's going to bring plugin systems to places that just never really could have them before. The challenge is, of course, that a lot of people have grown up learning to program on the web and they don't even know what it is and we kind of have to explain it to them a little bit. But that's really like a 
a powerful thing, right? And then the portability aspect is important because our stacks now are very diverse, right? Like even small companies that I've worked at, you usually have two or three or four programming languages across your stack. And plugin systems are historically very siloed to the languages that you choose, either on the guest or the host side. And it's a really huge lift to like run it somewhere else in your application that has a different language or like rewrite your application in a new language. And how do you bring your plugins with you? Really cool thing about Wasm is you can bring your plugins everywhere. And actually your plugins can actually outlive your host now. So in theory, your plugins, you know, if Stripe builds a plugin system, then maybe some other payment system like a Square can use Stripe plugins too, right? It's like plugins can actually live outside of the host if they're ultra portable. So there's the aspect of like letting people bring their language, but also about moving these plugins around and having them be independent from being these siloed things that only work in one person's application. One thing that goes hand in hand with security and it's usually the trade-off is speed or performance. And so like, yes, you can embed a JavaScript engine inside of your application. And this is kind of the common way you see, you know, like a C++ application. It's going to include a little scripting engine and it's probably JavaScript or Lua. And like Ben mentioned, you know, yeah, that's siloed to that one language. You can only write JavaScript and then extend this application, but it's very secure. Like, you know, exactly that boundary between the C++ host application and the JavaScript guest code that's extending it. Where you lose out in the trade-off is in the performance. And usually it's orders and orders of magnitude of a slowdown to go from native code in C++ and then into the scripting plugin environment in JavaScript. And WebAssembly provides this near native speed because that bytecode, that WASM is then compiled in most cases to native instructions and executed at near native speed in the host application inside of the process but it's isolated and has all the safety characteristics that you want out of a safe plugin system. And so not having to trade off security or performance really gives you this unique new superpower that WebAssembly provides that we really just haven't had in the past. And to Ben's earlier point, we used to be able to kind of load a DLL or a shared object into our desktop software. One of the other pieces there is we've moved a lot of the software up to the server. And like Ben mentioned, in a multi-tenant environment, you just can't load like a shared object and expect to trust that code in any way or shape. And it's actually kind of one of the foundations of the company, at least the name, Dilibso is a Mac, Dilib, and SO, Linux shared object as kind of like a, you know, acknowledgement to some technology that we think will be displaced for many use cases by WebAssembly. So a little bit of an appreciation for the old way, but making room for the new way that we think is much better across many dimensions. I love the name Origins. <laughs> yeah, makes a lot of sense now. The whole idea of the portability is super cool to me. I work on an application called Descript. It's an audio video editor and like a plugin system for us makes a lot of sense. And a plugin system that allows you to maybe use some like Python audio processing stuff or just like things that have already been solved elsewhere and to easily include them in a plugin that's a JavaScript web application, that is just like super awesome. And the ease of use is the real awesome part. Yeah, totally. We should talk about that. Uh, <laughs> this kind of stuff, like me wanting to reuse code. I mean, at the fundamental level, like having WebAssembly as a plugin system, you could use it in a bunch of different ways. It doesn't have to be to necessarily extend your software if you don't want it to be. It's like, let me take that Rust code and bring it into my Java app. Or let me take that Go code and bring it into Ruby. It's like, there's just so many ways you could mix and match code now. And even if you don't use XSM as a plugin system, it's a really easy way to get started with WebAssembly, which still today has some warts, you know, if you're not using a framework. I mean, I'm happy to go into more detail there, but that was also an additional lane that we considered of like, how do we make not only like this plugin system useful and out of the box, very capable for developers to use, but also as kind of a warm, fuzzy introduction into WebAssembly that doesn't kind of cause any pain or hurt you along the way. And there are some issues that people tend to hit that we feel are kind of a shame because it could maybe turn somebody off WebAssembly when just beyond that little hurdle, there's just this whole world of magic and, and amazement um, that you can experience. But a lot of people get kind of caught behind that. And Xism is a way around that hurdle. And it's not the right choice for everything, but it does help in many, many cases um, developers kind of get started with WebAssembly. I would like to dig into the performance and portability thing a little bit more. A lot of times, anytime you have a bridge between two execution environments, often your performance is not necessarily 
execution in any one of the environments, but the channel of communication, like message passing back and forth can be super expensive. And then if you're building any system that's incredibly portable, you tend to have to target sort of lowest common denominator. WASM is the lowest common denominator here, but there are certain things that you may not fundamentally have access to. For example, the file system, and for good reasons, right? If you're like shipping a WASM module to the browser, like there is no file system. So it's like, you know, what are you trying to do? So help me understand the story about the a little bit more and just as an example if you're like wanting to make an extension that like acts on files is it that your host execution environment your language that you're writing in has to actually sort of define some vocabulary for the wasm extension is like hey if you want to read a file here's what you need to ask me and then i'll send you back the contents and if that's the case what about that bridge like you know what is the cost there that's really a great question and it's really an important question to answering like whether WebAssembly is going to meet all your needs at this moment because I do think one of the limiting factors right now is yeah you're constrained not by the ability to invoke a function quickly or get a response quickly you're constrained by the amount of data that you might need to push across that boundary because there is a boundary and for good reason WebAssembly has its own memory addressing space and it can't escape that address space so if you want it to know about any data you have to copy your data into that space so there is some kind of copy in memory happening it's generally pretty quick but it can be a limiting factor if you have a ton of data. But that is something that I think is being worked on. And in the future, there will be ways to pass references, like safe references across that boundary. But I can't really speak to that at the moment. In terms of like files, as you said before, WebAssembly doesn't really have any kind of concept of files or systems or anything. But there is a standard that's emerging called WASI. It's a generic system interface. And it just appears to WebAssembly as a bunch of functions that implement sort of libc, POSIX-like stuff. And if you enable WASI in a plugin, or if if you enable WASI in a WASM program and you use a sort of WASI enabled compiler to compile your code, then it doesn't really see the difference between this WASI system and any other system that you're running like Linux or something, right? So if you want, you could pass a, a path to a file, to a plugin. It could load that from disk, operate on it, write it back. There's no reason that can't happen. And that does happen. And you also have a little bit more control. It's kind of similar to Docker where when you launch your WASM program, not only can you control which syscalls you can make, but you can also say like, if you open a file descriptor, you can only open in these paths and you can kind of create mounting points of my host directory versus my sort of guest directory. So you can constrain which files it can open and all those kind of things. And also you can sort of namespace them. So you could kind of think of it similar to Docker in that way. So how close is XISM to being WASI compatible? Or is that just still like very early? We support WASIs. Okay. And actually some plugins you have to use WASI. So we support it and you can use it today. But WASI is undergoing a transition to a new standard. It's still like an ongoing standard. So there are a few rough spots. Mm. I don't want to speak to any particular dates, but probably like by the end of this year, or next year, there will be like the new WASI standard that is going to be a little bit more stable. But right now they're in basically a preview mode. Gotcha. And for the most part, it works perfectly fine in most languages I've tried. It's not too bleeding edge. It's been out for a while. For things like, you know, I want to make a network call through HTTP, or I want to open a file mm -hmm. and write to it, or I want to print to standard out in the console. You're not going to find any problems with that. Like for most languages that have you know, a WASI target or some other tool chain that lets you compile that language to WebAssembly, all that code compiles just as if it would if you're compiling to x86 or ARM. The big difference are things like if I want to run a server or if I want to build a database, I need multi-threading or parallelism and I need some more complex system and resource control and management. Other versions of the WASI spec will introduce those things. The current version does not have them. So you're not going to use WebAssembly to like write a highly performant multi-threaded web server. You can certainly run WebAssembly inside that performant multi-threaded web server, and you can make network calls from it and read files and write files and all that stuff. So it's a moving target a little bit, but what we have today works really well and has surprisingly you know, wide support for a lot of things in a lot of different languages. For XSM specifically, we have an additional layer of control. So you create a plugin, you're going to now load that plugin in your program. When you load the plugin in your program, you have the option to provide it at load time and instantiation time with WASI or not. So if your plugin doesn't need it, you don't want to give it all these capabilities, you don't have to do that. You can choose to do so if the plugin needs it. And then we have another layer of control where in both the case where you're adding WASI and you're not, you have to specify the hosts that plugin has the network access to talk to, as well as those file paths that are going to be available to read or write data to from the plugin side. And it's also kind of cool because you get to like, you know, 
kind of puppeteer your own file system in a way. Like you can emulate, you know, a standard, you know, Linux distributions file system. And so you can pretend like you have an Etsy and a bin, you know, and a root and all these other kind of directories, you know, a program might be used to having, and then drop your own files and they're special for the plugin to use. And it thinks it's got access to the system, but in reality, you've given it this virtual world that it can play in and not cause any harm. Yeah, you also have a similar level of control over things like networking, which is really important, right? If you want to give it the ability to make network calls, you probably should not let it like call internal services and stuff, right? Sure. And the nice thing about your host being the one that provides all those syscalls is you can put whatever you want there. You can wrap them with things that actually control what those things do, right? Not only not opening files, it shouldn't, but also not opening sockets, it shouldn't, or really doing anything it shouldn't do. One more question on this topic, before we move on, given that, for example, reading from the file system or accessing the network, those are very explicit capabilities. Is there some way that plugins and or hosts sort of express like, hey, I support this or hey, I do this or hey, I need this? Because you can imagine it's like if you in the future built an extism marketplace of extensions, right? That really like, you could just like pull this into your system or whatever. They would only work in certain situations depending on what capabilities were required. So like, how does that sort of work in extism? Well, this is a really good question. I'm forced to mention one of our products because it solves this problem, which isn't solved you know, universally because it's not a unique issue to Xism, right? This is a WASM module that may or may not have certain functions exported to the host, and it may or may not have functions imported available to it from that host environment in reverse, right? There's a bi-directional relationship of compatibility between the host environment and the module that runs within it. And over time, I do believe that there will be more available tooling that that solves this, maybe from certain runtimes that do checks before modules are loaded. And also to be clear, like your module will fail if you try to load it and there is an inconsistency with the imports available you know, and we just won't instantiate it. All runtimes, you know, provide this as part of the spec. However, in the case of like a module not providing an export that the host needs to call it to actually like start the module, like an entry point, for example, there's really nothing. So like you ship your module up, it's instantiated, it's fine. And then they try to call it and it fails and you just get a runtime error and that stinks. And so this is a common problem. And so we've built some tooling for this and, um, you can download for free off our website called ModSurfer that comes with a CLI. And it's basically like a system of record for all your WASM that gives you insights into the imports, the exports, the function signatures that are on both of those sides, some complexity analysis of the module and other really kind of helpful information for just running like a production quality system that uses WebAssembly. But a feature of this is validation. And so we have this format called the check file that basically lists the expectations of that exact agreement, that contract between the host and the guest that says, I expect you to include these particular functions with these signatures, and I expect you to export these functions with these signatures, and I expect you to import from this namespace and not from that one, and I expect your complexity of the code to not be over some certain threshold and so on and so forth, basically allowing you to kind of add some policy to your WebAssembly code. And you run a command on Monster for CLI called validate, and you pass the module and you pass the check file. And then it just iterates through the module and does kind of a scan and says, hey, you know what? This module does not conform to the specification set in this check file. And then spits out a report for you to help you fix those problems. But the whole point here is like, how do we help close that gap between you know this feedback loop of I'm writing my module, I'm compiling it, I've got the WASM, I got to ship it up to its destination, whether it's an Xism system or one of the cloud platforms that runs WASM, and then I got to run it before I even can tell if it's going to work. And so we kind of short circuit that gap that says, well, before you go and send some traffic to that endpoint, see the failure, find the logs, read the logs, try to fix the problem, recompile the module, restart the whole process. Let's just short circuit it, run a validation and check that the expectations are met before we even bother shipping. And this is a really valuable tool. I think there will be some additional tooling probably supplied more globally from WebAssembly, maybe the Bytecode Alliance or elsewhere, but it's not available now. And so if you're really trying to find some tools to help you understand your code, validate your code, and implement some kind of policy on that code, a mod surfer is a really helpful tool. Awesome. Does that actually operate on the like direct web assembly, so not the source that's compiled to? Yeah, yeah. We actually kind of have the little, you know, pseudo policy within the company that like build our tools at the lowest level possible. Build analysis, build tooling, build validation, everything on the WASM instruction set, on the binary format that uses all of the 
sections within the binary itself uh, to cover as much universal language ground as we can. Because if we built tooling that's up at the Rust level or the Go level or the Ruby level, right, we're going to be implementing a lot of stuff over and over and over again. And because WebAssembly has the beautiful characteristic of everybody sharing the same target, let's use the target as our primary mode of operating or building. And so ModSurfer uses the format itself to do this validation check. So switching up gears a little bit here in JavaScript, it's Wasm was built for JavaScript. So calling out to WebAssembly modules in JavaScript is kind of trivial. But what about other languages? Like before Xtism was like calling into Wasm from other languages a challenge? Because like a big part of Xtism to me seems like you have this like common interface, doesn't matter what the language is, call two things and you've loaded up your WebAssembly. Yeah, so obviously people kind of know the history of WebAssembly being something that was in the browser. For the most part, it was designed to operate within any language, but obviously it was important that it be able to interop with JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And it's generic enough to interop with any language, but a lot of the early tooling that was built was just assuming that you're going to be loading and calling these modules from JavaScript, right? And the thing that's kind of missing is really what I would call like an ABI layer. It's really the layer of like, you know, how do you get data into it? How do you invoke functions? How do you get data out of it? A lot of the stuff that your compiler, your runtime and your language handles for you. And they're all things that are unique to your different target environments, your different languages. So yeah, it's been a challenge because a lot of tooling is assuming that you're using JavaScript. And there are a lot of good tools like Wasm Bindgen is one where essentially if you use something like Rust and a lot of these tools work in C as well, it will kind of generate a bunch of code that generates the bindings between JavaScript and your Wasm module. So in a way, Xtism is like, okay, let's ignore that and we'll just kind of write our own that works with every language. So that's kind of what Xtism is. That's what we're offering, right? We're like a generic kind of easy way to get data in and out of these modules and invoke the functions. We're kind of a generic universal ABI. And we also use some tricks to make it easy to kind of add this support for new languages and do stuff like that. So yeah, that is still a challenge. And as WebAssembly moves forward into the server, people are starting to kind of figure out ways to build these generic technologies and then kind of eventually roll them back into the JavaScript stuff, right? Like maybe in the future, we won't be using tools like Waz and Bindgen specifically. We'll be using some more generic tool and JavaScript just happens to be the host. One of the limiting factors for language support was the fact that WebAssembly runtimes just weren't available in a language. There's no PHP WASM runtime. You can't just like take a WASM file and in PHP natively execute the WASM in there. There needs to be something that interprets, that knows the byte code format, maybe even can compile it ahead of time or into native instructions. And these were limited to languages like Rust and C, where WASM time and WASM ed, WASMer and all these other runtimes were developed. And so that means only C and Rust kind of had native support to load these runtimes as libraries, link them, and then load a WASM module and execute it. And one of the things that Xtism did, which allows it to go to all these places, was decided early on that we were going to rely on the CFFI and provide an interface that allows us to do that work for you, to embed the runtime into your language in a common way that you don't have to think about as the developer, and then wrap that FFI in more idiomatic SDKs, libraries that make it feel like it's just native Ruby, it's just native PHP, it's just native Java. So to the developer, it just really looks like I'm loading a library, just like you do if you've ever used SQLite in your language of choice, right? You're really using a shared library, loading SQLite from the system, and then making FFI calls from your language into SQLite to make queries and insert and read data. And so Xtism works very much the same. The goal from the outset was universality. We want Xtism to run everywhere in as many platforms as possible. And this architecture is kind of the only thing that allows that. And so another element of this difficulty was just that there weren't runtimes in the majority of languages. So we kind of did the packaging job to get a WASM runtime into your language, but at the same time, wrap that runtime with some kind of convenience layer that makes it really easy to, like Ben mentioned, shuttle data in and out, make a function call within the WASM module itself without having to do the offset tracking and allocation and digging out that function from the WASM and executing it. And just knowing, you know, the calling conventions and the ABI of how to work with WebAssembly within one of those runtimes. Ironically, Xtism itself is a dialib. It is a shared object. So <laughs> we're using some of the old way of doing things to replace uh, 
as more languages probably get native support for runtimes, like I'll call it the Y0 project in the Go ecosystem, Xism could re-implement our ABI on top of this. And some work right. Ben did not too long ago was to re-implement the Xism runtime APIs in JavaScript to allow the same plugins that execute on you know, in a Ruby program or a Go program in a server environment to run in the browser and execute inside the JavaScript capable WebAssembly engine uh, that's found in all of the browsers today. Yeah, because in theory, the runtime they should all be the same. The Wasm is a standard. They should all be able to run Wasm. So Xism could just switch out the runtime with anything. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I did see that you'll have a playground, which is killer, like being able to load it up. Do you just literally drag your Wasm module in there and like load it up and that's it? Yeah, you can address it by URL too. So if you have it on GitHub or something, you can load it in, send somebody the link to your WASM and they can load it and then it will populate the dropdown with all the function exports available to it and then pass some date with a MIME type and it'll render it in another column if you want to be able to get a little preview. So it's a great even testing ground if you're not using a browser to try out your plugins before building a full-fledged host. The full-fledged host is the application within the plugin where the plugin resides and that takes work. And so this playground is kind of a place to just go try out your plugins, see how they work, give them some data, see what the return values are like and all that stuff. But again, this is going to be limited by capabilities here. Uh, we're assuming that you have like a pure WASM module that's like not making any like network calls or trying to do anything special. Yeah, but we can support that. So what we can do is basically Xism has its own way of making HTTP calls and we basically just give it the browser's fetch. And so we can support like certain host capabilities. It's not too uncommon for people to run WebAssembly and then use some of the browser's capabilities to emulate like libc like stuff like people stuffing local storage implementations where it makes file reads and writes there's a certain limit to what we can customize in the browser but for the most part it can run most of your plugins so we've talked about the tech a lot and i know it's early for you guys still but is anybody using xtism to do cool things and make cool apps yeah, a bunch of projects we can't talk about that we, you know, are interacting with kind of behind the scenes. But some of the ones that are open source, uh, my favorite is this project called Otoroshi, which is a proxy from a large French insurance company called Mate. And it's this team that built this proxy, I think mostly for internal purposes, but has open sourced it. I mean, you can check it out at Mate slash Otoroshi. And they've done an amazing job integrating Xtism to where any point in the proxy's chain where it takes a commit, a request in and before before it decides which backend or upstream it's going to take that request and you know redirect it off to or whatever it's going to do, you can make a new decision. And that's implemented as an Xism plugin. And they've even gone as far to like create some really excellent documentation, maybe better than our own docs um, for their product about how to use Xism inside of Otoroshi. And yeah, we're seeing it pop up in all kinds of little fun use cases. Ben, do you want to talk about that LED matrix project? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, that's something I want to try soon, but uh, a student made a programmable LED matrix where you could like pull down people's plugins and it drives it an LED matrix. Some kind of interesting sort of art pieces might be possible with this. Another thing I would maybe plug is something we created called Gamebox, which is kind of our canonical demo for Xtism. It's similar to like Jackbox games, but you can upload your own game as an Xtism plugin. And then you can have a group of people play like this sort of real-time distributed game on their phones. We're always trying to find new use cases and interesting use cases. I really think in the next like year or two, a bunch of interesting things will come from this, but it's actually kind of hard to predict what people will do with it because it feels like a fairly new idea of using plugins on the server. And if you go to xtism.org and just click the Discord link in the header, that's where you can probably find, you know, some interesting hints about other projects that are kind of emerging. I don't want to, you know, out the projects if they're not ready to <laughs> talk about, but there's lots of really awesome questions being asked. And, you know, just the community inside this Discord server has emerged as not a place where we're even disseminating that much information, but we're learning a lot from these people and kind of the things that they want to try out and implement. It's driving some of our road. So if you find anything that we don't support that you'd like support, please come join the Discord and, you know, rally some attention for your idea and reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Is it hard to do cross WASM support? So I was reading about SQLite having a semi-official WASM module. I was wondering if that's something that would be relatively easy to like bridge functionality between the two. So yeah, I can maybe answer this. There are a couple different ways that you can use like an external kind of piece of code in Xtism. One would be to somehow like statically compile it into your Xtism plugin. If that's possible, you can do that. And I haven't tried it. I think maybe someone has done this where they've gotten SQLite to run an Xtism 
Stism plugin. Another way would be something that we call host functions, which we didn't really talk much about, but it's a really powerful concept, which is that it allows you to provide references to functions in your host language to the plugin. So if you have, say, a database and you want to give your plugin the ability to, say, you know, look up accounts in your database, right? Like you could write a scoped function that you pass into your plugin and that would allow them to call it, right? And if your host is in Ruby or something, that would be a Ruby function. Or if it's in Java, it'd be a Java function. And I've done some SQLite integrations that way where I basically pass in a scoped function with a session for that user. And then I pass it in as a host function. So the plugin can make calls to a SQL database using the host functionality. There is also a emerging project standard, something in between called the component model from Bytecode Alliance that when realized will allow for a lot more of the interoperability between WASM modules. Like I think you're talking about, Jeff, where mm -hmm. I can take SQLite, I understand the contract that it provides between you know, the functions it's exposing and the functions it expects to receive from somewhere else. Maybe it's a host environment or maybe it's from another WASM module. And the component model would allow you to describe those in a format called WIT, which is an IDL that's unique to WebAssembly. And when you have a WIT file, there's tooling that'll allow the two modules then to merge together dynamically or statically. And so in the case of like a static linked SQLite into another plugin or another WebAssembly module, I think the component model will unlock a lot of those capabilities that are a little bit harder to unlock today. It's definitely possible. There's a cool tool called Wasm Merge, which does take two modules and put them together so long as the contract is met implicitly, but the component model should unlock a lot of that stuff. And that's out of the bytecode alliance. So you can go check that out. So we've mentioned it a few times, but I want to get like a clearer picture and then what's to come. So what is Dilibso? Like what's the goal of the company and what are some products or platforms that you plan to release with the company? Yeah, I mean, so at a very, very high level, it's really to help developers take their WASM to production. And that's vague, right? But there's a lot of surface area between, you know, your first code base, you're compiling to WebAssembly, and now I've got this WASM module. And what do I do with it? And where do I run it? And how do I track the code? And how do I version it? How do I understand what's inside that binary code? I can't just like click open it like a source file and see it. What's in here? And so we're building the things that we as developers have needed for the past 20 years or so of our careers, you know, writing code and shipping it to large production systems and being able to understand those systems once they're running and being able to debug those systems they're running. And so it really is a company built by developers who are trying to help mature this technology that we're very bullish about, but have run into all of the sharp edges that you could imagine, or maybe that you can't imagine, but are there. So the first couple of products that we're working on are all about like clarity and understanding what's in your WebAssembly code. I've mentioned this with that product called ModSurfer. And ModSurfer is like a, a tool you want to include in your pipeline. So maybe like you've got Maven or Artifactory and you want to like load code into it and use it as a repository for your code. ModSurfer is similar in that where in addition to like maybe placing your code somewhere in your system, you need to be able to understand where that code is, where does it live, and then some things about that code. Maybe some metadata you're associating with with it. Again, I want to understand what's the interface of that code. So we actually read the binary format, unpack all the information for you, store it in the database, and then provide some searching capabilities. So if you've got a message in Prob that says like, FD write failed, what am I supposed to do with that? FD write failed. I don't know what module it came from. I don't know what environment that's running. And I don't know which problem I have to start investigating in order to come to you know some resolution here. And so like you can take FD write the string and search it in ModSurfer and it'll list all the modules that have that function available to it. And at least give you some, you know, it'll reduce the surface area for where you need to start looking to solve a problem. There's a bunch of other use cases that Monsurfer is helpful for. I mentioned validation. Monsurfer also provides, at least that I'm aware of, the only auditing capability for companies that need to stay in some kind of compliance. So WASI, for example, in some cases can kind of open the door to maybe stepping outside of compliance. So if a module has access to read its environment's variables, but that module wasn't supplied by the company, it was supplied by some third party that might get you out of compliance with some vendor or some government regulator. And if you need to check your thousands or more modules that are stored in your system, you might not have built the infrastructure to like easily find which modules just have environ our get, which is the WASI function that exposes the capability for a module to read its environment variables. With ModSurfer, you know, I can define a check file that says specifically, show me all the modules that fail a validation that import that particular function. And I can quickly identify every single module that might put us out of compliance and then can fix that problem through whichever means necessary. 
It also helps with things like this transition from WASI Preview 1 to WASI Preview 2. At some point, you're going to have to deprecate modules that import from the old format, or at least identify them so you can recompile them or make them compatible with Preview 2. And so this auditing capability will give teams a much faster path to solving those kinds of problems. As far as what's next, we have a pretty awesome stack for observability. And as far as we know, this is also the first of its class to give teams actual runtime metrics on their WebAssembly code as it's run. So you're used to seeing things like traces in Jaeger or Zipkin, seeing which functions are running, how long that function takes, and then spans within that trace of what are the nested functions and how long they took. WebAssembly, people are operating it like a black box right now because the isolation is doing its job. I can't just expect to drop in a WASM module in my program and get the same metrics out that I get from a data dog or a new relic or other platform that provides those kinds of insights. And so we're doing a lot of this kind of primitive work to make that instrumentation and observability possible, we're in preview right now. So if this is interesting to you and you're listening, reach out. But soon we'll release a widely available observability stack so that you can get runtime continuous metrics out of your WebAssembly code as it executes and do performance optimization or debug you know, failing code um, and actually get those insights into the code as it runs. Sounds like a lot of tools that help you kind of like look into that black box and understand what's going on more so. So good things to have. Yeah, I think the general point of basically like going to WebAssembly, we kind of have to rebuild the world a little bit. And we, as developers, we kind of know what a lot of these things are that we need to actually run things in production. So you can imagine everything that you might actually need to run things in production that we now need to build in the WebAssembly world are going to be things that are kind of in our targets. Yeah. Observability is really important. Debugging yeah. is really important. <laughs> So one of the questions that we always ask all of our guests is something forward-looking and being that we're talking about WASM, take us through your vision or what you would like to see or what you think is coming in the future of the WebAssembly world. How is things going to change in the next few years? I'll give you two answers. I'll give you a short term and a long term. So I think short term, like short medium term, what you're going to see is basically isolation technology advancing and this being an evolution of isolation technology and allowing us to have applications that are much smaller and load much quicker. I think the obvious thing Thing for a lot of people right now in the short term is like, you know, do we need Linux to like call a function in a server, like for functions as a service platforms, right? Like, no, we don't really need that anymore. So why are we loading these huge like operating systems to invoke a function? And I think you guys had Matt Butcher on, I think Spin is a good example of who are trying to build these kind of functions as a service platforms. And WebAssembly is just a great target for that because it can scale to zero. It can load up really quickly. It's language agnostic. It's got everything that you need. So I think that's kind of one of the short term things you'll see. Longer term, what I'm excited about is a lot of this technology getting in the hands of people who haven't normally had access to it. It's been more the domain of like browser developers and like operating system developers. And this idea of like maybe turning everyone into kind of like a development platform, right? Steve and I both worked at a company called Recurly. We worked in the payment space. That's where we met. And a lot of these SaaS companies are kind of development platforms already, right? But what if they could actually start running people's code? I think there's a lot of stuff there. I also think that we'll start to see a lot of like standards around these that get passed around to different industries. I made a hint about like payments companies all maybe getting together and having a standard about like what a plugin looks like on one of their systems. And then the most out there ideas are really just, my opinion is the target for WebAssembly is just like anything that can compute. You know, anywhere where you can imagine like that we need to compute things like WebAssembly WebAssembly could possibly have a future there. And in 10 years, we're going to be really surprised at where WebAssembly kind of ends up. I, I definitely agree. I think even just a few years ago, if you told me the most exciting use case for WebAssembly is going to be outside the browser, I probably wouldn't have believed you. So I'm very excited to see where it goes <laughs> in 10 years. <laughs> Totally. Thanks for coming on, Steve and Ben. This was a fun delve into the world of Wassum and all of the tools that apparently don't exist. So I'm excited to see you guys build them. <laughs> right. Thanks so much for having us on. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. It was great, great to meet you and fun to talk to you guys about this. Yeah, super Now we're going to go buy some sensors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, and I'll, I'll go really use like that one. Extism. That's really hard for me to say. Extism. I got it. <laughs> we'll get it. Keep trying. <laughs> yeah, definitely come, definitely come jump on the Discord and uh, let us know how it goes. And yeah, super excited to try it. Well, we're happy to help you out. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Bye, y'all.